Hello everyone, it's Miss Ashley here again and welcome to day five of our kids lit book, National Parks of the USA. It is our last day, we're gonna wrap up the book today by learning about Alaska and then also the tropics. So go ahead, get comfortable and let's finish this book together. Just about everything in the 49th state is bigger and gnarlier than in the lower 48. The peaks are higher and the winter is colder. The rivers are wider and the animals scarier. Naturally, that's what people come here for, a big adventure. Some parks in this state don't even have trails. Hikers just set out into the backcountry to hike over tundra, cross thundering rivers, and bushwhack through willows. Others grab ice axes and crampons to climb mountains that rise past the clouds or jump on a boat to watch the whales. Glaciers are everywhere, engraving the land with beautiful valleys and filling pools with ice cold water. Winters are dark and cold, but the aurora borealis decorates the sky with glowing colors. Come summer in the far north, the sun never disappears below the horizon, and it's daylight for 24 hours, a phenomenon called the midnight sun. So some places we're going to learn about in Alaska here are the Denali, the Wrangler St. Elias, Glacier Bay, Kenai Fjords, Lake Clark, Katmai, Kobuk Valley, and Gates of the Arctic. The air is thin and it's negative 10 degrees as you plod up a snowy mountain with your down suit, goggles, boots, and crampons. This is the tallest peak on the continent, the 20,310 foot Denali. You're so high you can see the curve of the earth on the horizon. Far below, the rest of this park is a vast wilderness of wind battered peaks, boreal forests, tundra, and braided rivers. This place is big and so is the wildlife. Half ton grizzly bears lumber about looking for berries and roots. Wolf packs sneak up on caribou herds as they graze. And see those white dots on the cliffs? Those are doll sheep in their very steep homes. Alrighty, so Denali is located in Alaska. It was founded in 1970 and its size is 6,075,030 acres. Some animals and plants that we've got living here. In autumn, the snowshoe hare molts its brown and gray coat in order to grow a white one that blends in perfectly with the snow. It's tough to be a caribou calf. More than half of Denali's calves don't make it past the first two weeks of life because wolves, moose, coyotes, and even golden eagles eat them. The black spruce evergreen grows in harsh conditions and acidic soil just above the permafrost, another name for permanently frozen soil. Even a tiny stunted spruce could be more than 100 years old. The marsh labrador tea seeds known to sprout when the soil gets warm and the days grow long. There's almost 24 hours of daylight here in summer. The wood frog is a fingernail sized amphibian, can stop its heart, turn to ice and appears dead all winter. In spring, within hours of thawing, it's hopping around again. Doll sheep horns grow throughout the year, but slow down in late fall during mating season. By counting the rings on horns, called annuli, you can figure out the animal's age. Arctic terns are believed to migrate farther than any other bird on the planet, more than 37,000 miles round trip from Antarctica to the Arctic. Quaking aspens look like individual trees, but they're actually one big organism connected underground. Each trunk is an identical clone. Have you ever heard the sound of a wolf howling? No one knows exactly what the wolves are saying. Perhaps they're trying to find each other or the sound the alarm that a rival pack is near by. So much snow falls in Denali National Park that the roads close every winter. So how do rangers patrol the wilderness? On dog sleds. These Alaskan Huskies are the only sled dogs in the country that help protect a national park. Alaska Natives have been using this mode of transportation for thousands of years. Today, these dogs are still more reliable than snowmobiles. 
Even on temperatures of negative 40, all they need is some food and off they go. On a dark night, look up to see curtains of otherworldly green lights swirl and flicker across the sky. These are the northern lights, the planet's most spectacular natural light show. Also called the aurora, the phenomenon only occurs in high latitudes when energetic particles from the sun collide with gases in our atmosphere. People travel thousands of miles for a chance to see these eerie multicolored lights. About 70 million years ago, a very different cast of wildlife roamed Denali. Dinosaurs! Paleontologists have found more than 270 fossil and dinosaur track sites here. Back in the Cretaceous period, the climate was more like the Pacific Northwest. Imagine metasequoia trees towering over lush ferns and wetlands. Duck-billed dinosaurs as big as school buses stomped around in herds and predators the size of microwaves soared overhead on 25-foot wingspans. About 250 years ago, during a cold period known as the Little Ice Age, Alaska's Grand Pacific Glacier suddenly steamrolled 100 miles down a bay, scouring it of any life and chasing away the Hunnitzlingit people who lived here for centuries. Within decades, it reversed its path and receded to the size it is today, 35 miles long and 2 miles wide. Over the years, plants and animals returned walk through quiet rainforests covered in moss, nearby grizzly bears waddle, and wolves patrol beaches. From a boat in Glacier Bay, listen for the whoop of glaciers calving icebergs and the sound of a whale exhaling or crashing into the water in an impressive breach. So Glacier Bay is located in Alaska. It was founded in 1980 and its size is 3,280,198 acres. Glacier Bay's forests are teeming with colorful and delicious berries. The Hunnitzlingit preserved these tasty treats in thick, smelly seal oil so they'd have plenty to eat during the winter. Find mountain goats hopping along steep, rocky bear cliffs. Their hair is hollow to help insulate them from the extreme cold of Glacier Bay winters. In the 1960s, bald eagles were in danger of going extinct. The U.S. government protected their habitat and banned the pesticide DDT, which damaged their eggs. Now their populations are thriving. Look in the trees near shore to spot their telltale white heads. As a halibut grows, one of his eyes moves to the other side of his head so he can lie flat on the ocean floor and still see everything passing by. Devil's Club has enormous leaves and thorny poisonous stalks. Alaska natives have used it for everything from a remedy for arthritis to fish hooks and even deodorant. While black bears prefer forests, grizzlies live all over the park, eating everything from berries and plants to salmon and dead animals. Humpback whales. These gentle endangered giants came to Glacier Bay every summer to gorge themselves on fish. In one gulp, a humpback can take in 15,000 gallons of water, more than your house uses in five months. Tufted puffins are great swimmers and decent flyers, but it takes them quite some effort to get off the water and into the air. You'll see lots of western hemlocks in Glacier Bay Forest because they love the rich, moist soil and the beautiful swirling fog. In the 19th and 20th centuries, fur traders hunted sea otters almost to extinction. These playful creatures have recovered thanks to an international treaty and other protections. In Glacier Bay, they've boomed from five animals in 1993 to more than 8,000 now. As glaciers advance, they carve sheer, deep valleys. When they're close to the ocean, these valleys fill with seawater and are called fjords. In Glacier Bay, fjords plunge as deep as 1,400 feet and are often dotted with icebergs. The water is very cold and rich in oxygen. 
These are great conditions for tiny organisms like plankton and things that eat plankton like colorful cold water corals. After the Honolulu were chased off Glacier Bay by the Grand Pacific Glacier, they established a new village about 30 miles away. Just as they were ready to return to their homeland, the national park was founded. Rangers discouraged them from practicing their traditions, even though this was originally their land. There were a lot of hard feelings, but over the years, the Park Service and the Hunnitalingit developed a friendship. As a sign of peace, the Hunnitalingit constructed a tribal house in the park, the first built there in centuries. Now you can visit the house, which hosts ceremonies, smells deeply of cedar, and is covered in carvings that illustrate Hunna stories. Alrighty, so staff, if you want to go ahead and pause the video here, uh, you guys can take a break if you need it before we start the tropic. So go ahead and pause if you'd like to. Alrighty, welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed your short break that you just had. And now we are going to move from Alaska to the tropics. To get to America's farthest flung territories, you must travel deep into the oceans. Some of these islands are located thousands of miles from the mainland, and these remote steamy paradises smell the salty breeze that travels over the ocean and rustles your hair. Float in the warm waters of tropical seas, dive down to explore coral reefs brimming with fish, or survey the debris from slave ships that were wrecked offshore centuries ago. When you return to the surface, marvel at the fiery volcanoes that crafted these lands and continue to shape them today. Indigenous people have lived on some of the islands since long before the United States became a country. Much has changed, but many of the native people still collect fish to eat, make traditional and beautiful handcrafted items, and perform dances and ceremonies like their ancestors did for centuries before them. So places we're going to explore here in the tropics are the American Samoa, the Virgin Islands, Halkawa, and Hawaii volcanoes. On the big island of Hawaii, Kilua's hot lava lake casts a fiery glow. From the nearby observation deck, watch as it occasionally splatters the mountain with magma as hot as 2,400 degrees. This park protects two of the world's most active volcanoes, Mauna Loa and Kalua, and the bizarre landscapes they leave behind. Walk through black lands full of weird shapes of hardened lava, marvel at statue-like lava trees, and hike through the rainforest entering a deep, dark tube that once oozed molten rock. The landscape seems harsh, but it has hosted humans for centuries. While visiting, keep an eye out for native Hawaiians' homesteads and 23,000 petroglyphs carved into rocks centuries ago. All right, so the Hawaii volcanoes are located in Hawaii. They were founded in 1960, and the size is 333,086 acres. The Hawaiian tree fern towers up to 20 feet tall and 15 feet wide, but it grows incredibly slow, no more than three and a half inches a year. The scarlet honey creeper with its long beak, the iwi can slurp up nectar from long tubular flowers. Its call sounds like a squeaky hinge, just like its name. The apuila, or the Hawaiian red palm shrimp, also sometimes called the volcano shrimp. Um, seahorses love to eat these tiny red shrimp, which only live in ankyline pools, rare ponds in limestone, or volcanic rock that have layers of fresh and salt water, and tons of rare animals. Ohayas are the most common trees in Hawaii. They bloom constantly, attracting lots of birds and insects. The Mauna Loa Silver, swor silver so Sword, these rare plants have sword-like leaves with silvery hairs, and they only grow on Mauna Loa. 
Between the ages of 10 and 30, the plant shoots a stalk of flowers as high as nine feet tall, then abruptly dies. The Hawaiian goose, these endemic geese, had a tough couple of centuries. People hunted them and collected their eggs. Mongooses, dogs, and cats ate them. Even golfers have accidentally whacked these geese with golf balls. In 1951, there were only about 30 nene left. Now, thanks to efforts to breed them in captivity, about 2,500 live in the wild. Hawaiian lava crickets only live on the ceilings of newly formed lava tubes. They eat the roots of plants that burrow down through the cracks. The Hawksbill sea turtle is an highly endangered sea turtle that come to three beaches in the park to lay eggs. The hatchlings are vulnerable to mongooses, cats, dogs, crabs, and other predators. As few as one in a thousand make it to adulthood. The Hawaiian hawk. The endangered isle, or Hawaiian hawk, is endemic to Hawaii and only nests on the big island. In Hawaiian culture, it is a symbol of royalty. During the first five years of life, a koa grows as fast as five feet annually. Its wood is valuable and has been used to make houses, spears, paddles, and even surfboards. In the Hawaiian language, koa means bold, fearless warrior. According to local culture, Peel, the Hawaiian volcano goddess, lives inside Halamua, the erupting summit caldera of Kaloa. When you see the red-orange molten lava, you know that she's home. Local Hawaiians frequently come to the park to pay their respects to this important goddess through hula dancing, chanting, and ceremonies. As hot lava travels downhill, it cuts a channel like a river. When the surface of the stream hits the cool air, it hardens fast, creating a tunnel. Once the flow of lava stops, a long skinny cave known as a lava tube remains. Inside, there are wild formations that only occur in lava tubes, such as soda straw sta stactylites that hang from the ceiling in beautiful, delicate threads. It's 75 degrees and sunny. Feel the warm sand between your toes and wade into the turquoise waters of the Virgin Islands. Just offshore St. John, seagrass beds and coral reefs teem with fish as colorful as confetti. Put on your snorkel and watch as a white spotted file fish changes color before your eyes and a friendly polka dotted trunk fish poses for your underwater camera. There's even an ancient underwater fish pen probably constructed by the Taino people who lived here centuries ago. On land, explore the spooky stowed ruins of sugar plantations built in the 1700s and hike through rainforests that smell like tropical fruit trees. At the top of the hill, you can gaze over the sparkling Caribbean Sea. What would it have been like to see Christopher Columbus's ship on the horizon? So the Virgin Islands are in the territory of the Virgin Islands. They were founded in 1956 and its size is 15,135 acres. Every night, certain species of parrotfish create a clear mucus sac to sleep in like pajamas. Scientists believe it masks their scent, keeping them safe from predators. The golden orb spider is a black and yellow spider that spins beautiful webs made of golden silk. The threads are believed to be stronger than bulletproof vests and have been used to make rare garments or clothes. Virgin Islands National Park's forests are dotted with wild fruit trees that smell fragrant and sweet. In the foliage, look closely for soursop, papaya, mango, sugar apple, and calabash, which can grow to the size of basketballs. Don't stick your hand into a dark hole in the reef. A sharp-toothed moray eel might live there and mistake your finger for a fish. The fishing bat, or greater bulldog bat, uh, uses echolocation, consists of making a sound and listening for its echo to determine on an object's location. 
Fishing bats use the technique to detect ripples in the surface of the water, then nab fish and insects with their long claws. Sea fans are soft corals, which are actually large colonies of tiny animals. They grow across the current so they can net plankton to eat. The kapok tree. These common trees produce seed pods packed with silky fibers that are very buoyant. These fibers have been used for life, pre life preservers and stuffing for pillows. The only native palm left in the park, pieces of the tear, were used for baskets and brooms, fish traps, and roofing by native people. The largest of all the hard shell turtles, the green sea turtle, grows as big as 350 pounds on a diet of plants and algae. Magnificent frigate birds nest in colonies, but they better not leave their homes unattended. Their neighbors might come by and eat their eggs. Surrounded by sea, St. John is at the whim of the winds. Blowing east to west, the trade winds blow clear across the Atlantic, sometimes blanketing the island in dust from the Sahara Desert. In the summer and fall, hurricanes rage through Carry the leaves from trees and strewing branches all over the island. What's the upside of consistent winds? When it's not storming, it's a great place to cruise around in a sailboat. Like many other islands in the Caribbean, in the 17th and 18th centuries, Europeans colonized St. John. They whacked down much of the rainforest and planted sugar cane to feed the growing hunger for yummy sweets. Tragically, they brought enslaved people from Africa to work the plantations in terrible conditions. The Dutch abolished slavery in the Virgin Islands in 1848. In 1917, the U.S. bought the islands from Denmark. Today, you can still see the stone ruins of the old sugar cane plantations and bills, and even a dungeon hidden in the greenery of this national park. Alrighty, so that does bring us to the end of our journey. So let's read one last page and then we will be done. You've come to the end of your journey and by now you've realized that the national parks are pretty fantastic. But did you know that they're also surprisingly fragile? Their welfare depends on people like you and me who care about and protect them. The parks haven't always been well cared for. Back in the 19th century, when the national park idea was new, travelers didn't really know how to behave. Some visitors shot the wildlife, fished out the streams, and even pried off pieces of geyser rock to take home as souvenirs. Some even fed the bears. That made the creatures connect humans with food. Not such a good idea, right? Thankfully, the army swooped in and soldiers protected the animals from poachers. In 1916, the National Park Service was founded to steward these lands. Today, we know it's not cool to feed the animals of any size, steal artifacts, leave graffiti, or chuck trash into the bushes. There are still threats to parks, such as climate change, air pollution, and dangers like unwise mining and development. But the best thing you can do is to go out and experience the parks, learn about them, love them, and spread the word so that everyone knows how important they truly are. Get out of the car and into the mountains, deserts, beaches, and tundra. Drink in new scents and listen to the sounds of creatures, water, and wind. Let the marvels of national parks stoke your curiosity and be sure to bring that zest for exploring home with you. The parks might be grand examples of what nature has to offer, but the beauty of the natural world is never far away. Go out into your own neighborhood and see for yourself. What beautiful treasures might you discover right under your nose? And with that, boys and girls, that brings us to the end of our third Kidslet book, National Parks of the USA. I thank all of you for joining me this week and reading the book. I hope all of you enjoyed it, and I hope all of you have found a greater love and passion for the National Parks of the USA. Bye, everyone.